Hello and welcome to this Astranti Top 10 Most Likely Unseen Issues for the August 2019 Strategic Case Study Exam on Transport Network Company Zoom. So before we start, I'm just going to go through a bit of an introduction to this particular video and where I've got the information on and what you need to do with said information. So how have I come up with these top 10? Well, first of all, you look at the focus in the pre-scene. If there's a lot of material in the pre-scene on a certain topic, then it's likely that there is some kind of importance of that topic. It's likely to be brought up in the exam, so there's more to talk about. And that feeds into the second point here, the degree of importance attached to it by the examiner. But that particular section extends beyond purely what's in the pre-scene, but also what SEMA like to examine. For example, ethics. It may be that there's no real mention of ethics in the case study, but ethics is considered very important by SEMA, and therefore they are likely to examine it. Next is the strategic importance. How important is it to the organisation? If a certain topic is very important to the company, for example, say, uh, their suppliers. If they rely very heavily on a certain supplier, then it's likely that there might be an issue on the supplier. If something were to happen to that supplier, what impact could that have on the business? And also, just a more general experience in doing these videos in creating mock exams and reviewing exams in the past, the typical kind of issues that come up and what kind of things have the examiner brought up in the past. And my final point here is about how easy it is to write issues on that subject. The people who write the exams are obviously people too, and they will go for ones that they know, go for ones that they know that they can write good questions on. So what do you need to do for these issues? Well, first of all, it's important to prepare key models. So this will be things like your SWOT exam, like uh, SWOT analysis, like your PESEL analysis. Because building up this information now will help you to adapt the new information given you in the unseen, or help you to have that, that context to apply the unseen material. Next thing you need to do is practice exam questions on these issues. As this will help you to understand the kind of questions that will be asked around these topics and how to answer them. And also, this next section here, it will help you to plan these answers in your mind so that when you go into the exam and you start writing, you will already have a background to in which to apply this new information. You'll already have certain points to bring up in your head as you're writing for them. And I've also put some more generic things here, such as the advantages and disadvantages of these certain topics, uh, where they would be used and how models can be used to support them. So let's move on to the top 10 issues now. So we'll start our top 10 most likely issues analysis with issue number 10, which is risk management. And the reason why risk management appears here is because it is one of the key P3 topics. Throughout the pre videos, I've also been speaking about risks. I've also been speaking about risk management. And it is one of the most substantial parts of the SEMA syllabus. And it appears very, very regularly. It's part of the role that is given to you by SEMA as the preamble to the strategic case study. And it generally comes up throughout every single pre-scene, every single unseen that has happened since the case study was introduced in March 2015. And risk management involves identifying risks. It involves looking at how we would manage particular risks. Are we going to mitigate them? Are we going to find some way of reducing them? Are we going to just accept them because it's going to cost too much to deal with it using those Tara models, for example, also looks at mapping risks and putting controls in place. The difference between risk mapping and a standard risk reporting is that when you map a risk, you look at the, the likelihood of it, you look at the damage, the impact it's going to have on your organization, and that allows you to quantify the risks, provide a value to them, 
which allows you to then rank your risks and deal with them each in turn, the ones that are gonna have the most impact on your business. So primarily, one of the reasons why I've chosen this as one of the issues is because it generally comes up almost every single time and it's a key P3 topic. And there was an entire section, two pages dedicated just to the key risks of the organization. Although there's about five or six risks on that particular page. Whereas those of you who watched the risk video that I did, we came up with more than double that again. So likely issues that could arise would be the specific risks to a project. So the, for example, a new project, let's say that we're gonna be investing more in driverless cars. What kind of risks could come of that? Could we lose our money? Could there be an accident? Are we going to branch out and start trying to attract new markets? Are we going to try and export our business overseas? to uh, other countries where ride sharing is very prevalent, but we do not have a presence. What kind of risks could face us there? Could there be a cultural difference, a difference in the way we need to market it? Are there different political aspects to it in terms of, is the government of that particular country very pro homegrown business? Also, it may relate to uh, risks of the organization as a whole. Are they dealing with the risks as effectively as they could be example, with the, the staff and the drivers who are self-employed, independent contractors, is that a risk in that we they are still representing us, but we do not have any control over them? Would it be better off them being employees and having more different hours and having more rights? Now, that may not be as effective and flexible for them, but then it would also provide them with more buy into the company and also provide them with more rights, which again was another thing mentioned in the pre-scene. Also, how could they manage the risk? What kind of methodology have they got in place, such as cost, such as Tara, et cetera, how, how these things could be used more effectively within the organization, the role of an audit committee, of which there was no mention of one, and maybe that is a weakness in the approach of the risk management of Zoom, and how they oversee and control risk, and ultimately set the culture of risk. And that doesn't mean a culture of risk taking, it means a culture of risk management so that each individual is managing their own risks. Each individual is identifying risks. There is a culture installed in the organization of watching out for risks, combating risks as and when they arrive, rather than just, well, who cares? The risk committee meets once every six months. Maybe they'll think of it when they meet. Let's just not worry about it and move on. That's not gonna be beneficial for the business. So quite a few risks that were outlined in the pre-scene, either in the, the risk report or generally throughout the uh, pre-scene itself. Big competition here. Optim is substantially larger than us, have a bigger market share than us, more of a presence around the world, more investment in driverless cars so far. So there is a, a lot of competition. Also new entrants as well entering the market. Damage to reputation, risk articles in the pre-scene talking about people being injured as a result of driverless cars. There's the, the real world examples of uh, passengers who have been injured or assaulted by independent contractor drivers and what damage that can have on the reputation. Data leaks as well. We've got a lot of sensitive information. So the strategy of the organization about bringing people together it means that we are, in a sense, going to need to invest more in uh, the sort of driverless car technology. We need to invest more in safer, cleaner usage, which could have a, a business impact. I'm not saying it's not good from a, an ethical perspective, from an environmental perspective, but the actual strategy of the organization lays out a form that is potentially not as profitable as it could be. It's also quite limited in its scope as well, and that may hinder our thought processes. Governance, there were not enough non-executive directors. Admittedly, it's not a public company, it doesn't have to have any, but there is a lot of hinting throughout this precinct that there may be an IPO due to the fact that the venture capitalists have invested a lot, the company's still lost making, they need a lot of investment, 
which of course is another risk here. And so they may try to realize their investment by launching an IPO, which of course will mean that, that we then will need to comply with the Jalen Code of Corporate Governance. And staff and IT needs as well, very important to over 1400 employees working at the head office. We want staff to be safe, we want them to be innovative, we want them to feel respected where they are. And we also need a lot of technology. Technology is one of the driving factors of this organization. And so constantly needing to be kept up to date on the latest technology, constantly needing to implement the latest technology as and when it arises. Also the importance of risk and the importance of embedding a risk management methodology, how that helps control the risks within a business. You're not letting things slide. Everyone is being aware of them. That is also a way in which you progress a business from a risk management perspective. The way you install that kind of thing and the risks will then manage themselves more effectively. And a few theories that you can use here See, I've already mentioned such as the, the audit committee risk mapping, which I mentioned earlier, the Tara models that I spoke about, and the big one being the COSO risk methodology. This is one of the, the big overarching risk tools. As you can see, I've got a picture of the specific cube here. Now, what I will say as a caveat to this is that you need to speak about these, but you need to speak about them from a very high up holistic perspective, the importance of implementing them, how implementing them helps keep our strategy on track, how it helps manage risks within the organization. What it doesn't mean is explain to me what internal environment is an objective setting, event identification, risk assessment, risk response, control activities, information communication, and then we need to speak about the, the various different things here, such as strategic operations reporting, compliance, and whether it's at the subsidiary or the biz, blah, 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 and so on. Because that will take pretty much most of your hour to answer the question. And you were tested on your knowledge in your P3 exam, or even earlier with regards to things like the COSO risk cube. So please do not spend all your time talking about the various different components of it. You will not get a question in your exam that asks you to explain the eight different stages in the COSO risk methodology. You will not be asked to explain the four different parts of it or the four different business levels in which it can be applied to. You'll just spend all your time explaining. Even if you explain it perfectly, you'll get no marks because you will not be asked that question. So. Remember to use risk management from an overarching holistic strategic application perspective, not right down into the ins and outs of the various different components of it. And generally risk management will also appear as an add on question. So it's more likely to be now that we have discussed this particular option, what are the risks with it rather than just purely and simply asking you a question about risk. So on to issue number nine now, which is ethics. And ethics is, well, I put one of the most, but it is probably the most commonly examined SCS topic. It has appeared in two to three variants in every single sitting. So potentially more than half of you will be getting a question on ethics in your exam. And again, it's one of the key parts of the SEMA syllabus and one of the key parts of your role in the strategic case study. And SEMA want to be seen as testing people on ethics. And there's also been specific focus, although not as many as there has been in the past, where there's been health organizations, there's been pharmaceutical organizations, etc., where ethics is a much more substantial part. But the nature of the industry still has an ethical aspect to it because we are using vehicles, which means they're going to be damaged to the environment. We are allowing people to drive these vehicles around vehicles which can be turned into weapons i mean there's been plenty of instances of people using vehicles as weapons particularly in the last few years and uh, and so there is an ethical aspect to it particularly with regards to the risk to health and safety the risk to driver safety the risk to passenger safety etc 
And that was confirmed in one of the articles in the precinct where there was a mentioning about a specific incident that had happened. Some other likely issues could be to do with the values of the organization. It's very environmentally friendly. It wants to be seen as a company that's protecting the environment. It shouldn't compromise on those values, it shouldn't compromise on those principles. And what I do mean here when I say ethics and issues, so it doesn't necessarily mean that there's problems with their ethics. It just means there's questions relating to ethics. So the fact that they have good ethics may not mean there won't be a question on ethics and there will be an issue on ethics. Also, the reputational risk, how that ties in with ethics and the importance of staff to the organization, the importance of treating the staff fairly, the importance of giving staff a voice, the importance of uh, owing a duty of care to our staff, be they the actual staff or also the independent contractors. So potential for legal liability with regard specifically to those independent contractors or whether they where they're representing us are we liable for anything that they do as they are acting as agents on our behalf or because they are not actually employees of ours they are not necessarily or we are not liable for what they do another big one here is data use has been a lot of talk about data in the last year the gdpr rules coming into effect with the uh, the cambridge analytica scandal with facebook and uber as well for a specific industry example had a lot of their information a lot of their data stocked credit card information etc and they lied about it and said it didn't happen and then it was discovered that it actually had happened many months later of course that in turn led to a big damage on the reputation of the organization and other issues that have arisen in the past have specifically come up in the unseen exam rather than being related to the pre-scene things like confidentiality is in a, a colleague of yours trying to cover something up which wouldn't appear in the pre-scene but you may be given something about it in the unseen the treatment of suppliers as well, be that your company's treatment of them, but also the treatment of staff at those suppliers. If you are not auditing your suppliers and they are doing things that are not within your own values, then you are potentially in breach of your own personal ethics by continuing to work with them. And also bribery, bribery to win a new contract, for example. Now, bri bribery is probably the, the one thing that more than anything else that is absolutely black and white not acceptable with ethics in the SEMA exam you almost want to treat it like it is black and white like it's completely binary it's either ethical or it's not ethical and if it's not completely ethical then it's unethical now in the real world there is a gray area we all know that but within the confines, the strict remit of the SEMA exam, you should treat it as binary. And as I've already explained, as I've just explained that SEMA do expect you to be highly ethical and they do expect you to take the moral high ground. You must treat everything as either ethical or non-ethical. And do make a recommendation that's a two-part recommendation, paragraph explaining why we need to deal with this particular issue. For example, maybe there is an injury on site. Perhaps in the office, someone trips over a chair or trips over a cable, something as simple as that. You wouldn't think of that from a, how we're gonna, what kind of issues are gonna affect Zoom, the, the transport network company. But these sorts of things do happen every single day and the companies themselves are liable. So how do you deal with it in the short term? Changing the safety procedure, perhaps make sure that all, uh, cables are tied down or make sure that there are no loose cables but then also how do you solve that issue from from solving sorry arising ever again perhaps move to more wireless technology so you do not have cables around and things like that so you're you're looking to how to fight the fire in the short instance but then in the long run how do we just make sure that such a thing never arises again And some theories that you can use, We've got the SEMA ethical principles here, SEMA will appreciate that if you use it. But whilst you can explain the SEMA ethical principles or what they are and the five different parts of them, again, just as I mentioned with the risk management and the cost of report, 
then only talk about the one that is relevant. If it is a confidentiality breach, then talk about confidentiality. Don't also then say integrity is where blah, 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 blah. Professional behavior relates to a such and such. An example of this would be X, Y, Z, because again, that is not the question that you are being asked. And if you are stuck, a lot of students do struggle with idea generation. One model that you can use, it's not something that's in the syllabus, but it's a really useful thing from an ethical perspective of thinking and understanding whether or not there is an ethical issue or not, is the American Accounting Association resolution model. So think, are we owing a duty of care to this person? What could be the consequences of not doing it? What are our values and what are the cultural norms within Jayland, within this particular industry, etc.? And also a very good phrase here is ethics is simply the right thing to do. If you are arguing with your superior in your exam about what you uh, should be doing, they think, oh, this seems like overkill to go in here, but you know that it's very ethical, then use the phrase, it is simply the right thing to do. So thank you for watching this video. I hope you have enjoyed it and more importantly, you have found it useful to finish by just telling you a few things about the products that we produce here at Astranti and the ones that, that are part of our course. So these materials can all be purchased as part of the course or purchased individually. So we have our study text. We have three study texts for all the objective test exams. So three study texts for E1, P1, F2, F3, etc. But we also have the study text specifically for the case study exams split into two parts. The first is about how to approach the exam, how to analyze the information, how to plan your answers, how to write your answers. And also the second part, which looks at the key theories from the objective test levels that are relevant to the particular case study. So if you are looking at P2, P3, oh, sorry, P2, F2, E2 for the management exam, F3, P3, E3 for the strategic case study exam, and so on. We have our course videos, which look at how to plan your answers, how to manage your time effectively. These are the key reasons why people fail the exam. We have our pre-scene analysis, which looks at the pre-scene in a lot of depth, applies key information to that, and also concludes with the strategic analysis where we look at the various different models in the SEMA syllabus and apply them to the case, and also the top 10 most likely issues to arise in your exam. Generally, we have a 70 to 80% accuracy rate on our top 10 issues. Our industry pack, which details in great depth the history and the current contemporary issues within the particular industry that the pre-scene is based on. We also have 20 to 25 industry examples that you can use within your answers. We have mock exams that can be purchased with or without marking and feedback where you can get some real exam practice in, look for the kinds of things that the examiner is going to bring up in the exam and also get marking and feedback from expert markers who have marked for SEMA and for us for many years who know exactly the kind of things that exactly the kinds of things that the examiner is looking for exactly the kinds of mistakes that students often make and can provide lots of detailed feedback to ensure that you improve on your performance we also have our master classes which are two day long classes which look at all the key issues facing students in the exam. We will also go through live planning, showing you how to plan your answers effectively, how to write your answers effectively. Again, key things that cause people to fail the strategic case study exam or any of the case study exams for that matter. And also, if you do sign up for our course, provided that you have filled out your forms, provided that you have submitted your mocks, provided you have done everything to show that you have really given it your all to try and pass this exam. We also offer a pass guarantee, giving a free reset to anyone who fails the exam.